Hey everyone, glad you could join us on this Thursday. Welcome to LinkedIn Live. We're excited about this format and the opportunity for some interaction with you. Welcome to this series from Cantata. This is a, a series where we'll be working through some topics to help you navigate the path forward in this, this year, a, a tumultuous type of service environment. And we will endeavor to uncover some great insights on future-proofing your professional services business um, across that, the range of businesses, whether it's um, consulting, um, services within software, marketing services, and the like. We, we're going to focus the series on a lot of the challenging economic and uncertain business con condition topics. And to get us rolling, I'll introduce myself. I'm Brent Trimble. My co-host for the series is my um, esteemed colleague, Banu Debudi. We are both uh, vice presidents in our advisory service practice here at, at Cantata. So we get to see a lot of our clients both in their formative uh, pre-sales journey all the way through existing clients who've been with us for certain, you know, uh, fairly, fairly good length of time and listen to their um, challenges, their opportunities, both now and in the future. So we're really entrenched in the business challenges that um, professional services business face on a daily basis. We're excited to host this series together. We have some great interactive discussions planned and we hope that you join us. So um, Bono, it would be great for you to give an intro as well. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Agreed. I'm really excited for this series and for the opportunity to engage with our audience. I have to admit, it's my first LinkedIn Live, and I am a little bit nervous. So looking forward to your questions. Let's make it interactive. We'd love to uh, hear your questions as well and respond to those. One of the things we wanted to do across this series is surface some of the looking predictions and findings you all may have seen coming from leading analyst firms and bring on our domain experts from Kentata to really help apply professional services lens to those predictions asked. And then ask them what specifically to do uh, and what to deal with the trends and stay ahead of them. Uh, be able to target professional services business industry and make sure that uh, our, our experts can respond to what are some of the key um, challenges the challenges that they're facing and how to respond to those our original guest speaker unfortunately could not attend chris Callia had an emergency and isn't able to join us today instead joining us today is cantata's brand evangelist charles uh, gustin uh, who we've brought on to explore a topic that is top of mind for i'm sure a lot of the audience, how to optimize your business during uncertain economic times. Charles is going to moderate today's session. He's been very attuned to the pre predictions and research that have been coming in with the turn of the year, and is going to ask Brent and I questions today that we'll answer. And as I said, please have your questions coming in as well. Charles, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, Banu. I am also really excited to be here today. Also nervous, first LinkedIn Live. Uh, but I'm really excited to prompt some great discussion. I think let's dive right in. Uh, I want to start with a sort of prelude question so that we can define what we mean by uncertain economic times. And part of that is acknowledging that no one is actually certain what lies ahead. Um, but the fact is, and I think the research backs this up, people are already changing their behaviors and their plans based on a really high degree of confidence that there is turbulence ahead, even if it's hard to define exactly what we're in right now. Um, I was looking at some research from PwC, uh, very recent, that showed that 81% of executives believe a recession is imminent, and 47% say they are already making changes to strategic planning based on current business decisions. So they're seeing, they're, they're seeing that belief materialize in their customers, in their peers, and they're already changing their behavior because of that belief. So Brent, I'll start with you. In your experience, what are some of the typical reactions you see when this belief becomes pervasive? Um, and what are some of the impacts of those reactions that business leaders tend to have? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think in our context, we get to really understand um, clients and business in, in two, two aspects, two, two facets. 
One is their cont com contemplation, their evaluation, and their their sort of journey of process and, and maturity, which culminates with a potential purchase of enterprise software, which, which we provide. Conversely, we get to really get to know them, the business that they're in, the pressures on that business. So in, in those aspects, what we're hearing is in the, the journey side of organizational maturity, many, many firms have really experienced a lot of tumult over the past 24, 36 months anyway, of course, with the global pandemic. So there's much more deliberation. There's probably a bit more um, rigor and thinking, validation, certainly uh, return on investment sort of contemplation in the software journey side. On their business, they understand that certainly um, there's going to be a lot of fighting, um, really scraping through maybe some, maybe some bumpy times ahead this year. But um, I think the experience of sort of the past three years um, from, from the leaders we've talked to, there's certainly no panic. I think it's more of a resignation and acknowledgement that um, there is uncertainty. Uncertainty has become the norm and they're really soldiering through it. I'd say those are kind of the two trends and those, those two facets of how we're um, talking to leaders and, and understanding how they're, how they're approaching the year ahead. And you know, I it's think, interesting. Um, Sorry. No, I was going to say, Bon. I mean, I mean, I know you and I have been talking about this and some of the styles and changes in, in, in leadership and, and how they're approaching this, um, this year. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was listening to actually an interview with Dan Shapiro, the CEO of LinkedIn um, on Bloomberg business uh, week. And it was, it was on point in that he was speaking about two types of leadership, right? The reactive leadership and adaptive leadership and was inviting leaders to be more of an adaptive leader in these uncertain and chaotic periods that we've had over the last three years that will not end, right? And his point was, you know, it's, it's critical not to, as you said, Brent, to be very intentional and not respond to all that's out there because there is a lot out there. Uh, and he he basically prescribed three steps to be this adapt. Uh, and the first step was make sure you have all the information that you need and have, have the information validated so that you you make sure that you have all, all the accurate inputs that you need to make the right decisions, right? And then Therefore, once you have all the information, you've validated it, and you, you then have the opportunity and the next key step is to synthesize, synthesize that information so that then you can decide what are the, the actions you're going to take. And at, when you determine those actions, be very bold in taking those actions, but also communicate. And that's the third step. I thought it was, it was very on point and, and excellent point is make sure that the teams, the colleagues, everyone, it over communicate, help them understand the analysis and the thought process that's gone into the actions and the strategy changes that you're, you're making uh, and, and why you're making them and how it's going to benefit the business and them in the long term. So I thought that was very on point. Yeah, and I think that ties in really well to, to our next question, which is going to touch on the importance of, of forecasting and really detailed planning, because I think that when you don't have those things, it's really easy to be overreactive to the headlines and almost go into like a turtle shell behavior of like, well, we don't know what's coming. It seems like something bad is coming. And so your business can't help but retract into the turtle shell and make almost like non-decisions and and behave safely like in the most cautious way possible rather than forging ahead confidently because you don't know what's around the corner whereas businesses that know what's around the corner sort of know what they need to do to navigate the the shifting winds that come so 
Uh, the next prediction that I really wanted us to react to that I'm referring to comes from Tech Market View, and they say that as the global economic downturn bites, businesses are going to face cost pressures. Like we, we know that that's one of the big things that comes is that is that you face those cost pressures and you fight to really preserve your margins as you expect maybe less new customer acquisition. And that's going to make it really more important to streamline your back office processes like cash collection. And it's going to increase the pressure from your shareholders for more detailed revenue and cost planning with an emphasis on better demand forecasting, like I referred to, and this notion of like contract life cycle management. So, Banu, what are some of the biggest challenges you are seeing professional services firms grapple with in those areas that I mentioned right now? You know, uh, Charles, the tech market findings are not a surprise, I don't think, to any of us, right? And obviously, cost pressures, handling cost pressures, having much better uh, control over your, your margins is critical. And I would say the number one challenge we see out there is the transparency, having transparency into your business down at the detail that you need to take uh, actionable action, the correct, the correct action, right? So lack of transparency is, uh, in my mind, is the number one challenge that we, we hear as we interact with prospects and clients and all the material that we go through. And that comes from not only you know the fact that they have processes they have disparate processes and technology right so to really get a perspective um, at the right time timely ahead of the ahead so that they can be proactive versus reactive uh, is is not always accessible or uh, or possible and then the second one one of the challenges in the professional services specifically is resource management, right? How do we continue to predict um, demand and um, make sure that our capacity line to be able to uh, meet that demand? And I just want to do a shout out to a recent Cantata sponsored survey uh, that RMI did specifically around resource forecasting for this reason. And in that survey, uh, they highlighted that um, half of the businesses cannot accurately forecast resource needs beyond two months. Uh, best practices for RMA is six months. We actually did a podcast, Professional Services Pursuit, with Mark Lacroix on this topic, and I invite the audience to, to actually listen to that. So having the tools and the process to be able to know where your demand is and where um, you know how your capacity can fulfill that, the ability to be able to uh, understand where you have skill gaps and, and where you may need to fill those skill cap gaps most cost effectively, right? Is that with within internally cross training, um, et cetera, is, is also a challenge um, for a lot of clients. Um, lack of focus, I would say, is the last point that I wanted to bring up. And um, generally, I think part of the challenge is that uh, companies sometimes are very reactive. Again, when you're responding to chaos, sometimes because of change, uh, there, there is, there, there is, you're, you're going uh, many different directions. Whereas, if there is focus, and the focus and prioritization is around customer needs and understanding those customer needs and being able to respond to those customer needs, and then right along and as equally important understanding your colleagues and your how you, how you can position your colleagues to respond to those customer needs but also to continue to develop their own careers and and be content and happy with the job they have is is uh, is it, i think i think are two very critical uh, focus areas and i don't think um there's always a challenge staying focused on what's important Brent, I don't know if you have any of that. I think it's, you know, those are, those are, those are really all good points. I think the one uh, quote I, I think our CEO uh, brings up is this notion of not, uh, you can't cut your way to, uh, to growth, right? Uh, or something along those lines. And then while they're, they're certainly having that rigor and, and measurement and insight into the business, um, it's still a time to really, you know, potentially, potentially utilize some of these elements we've talked about, you know, if you don't have transparency, for instance, beyond, 
um, two months, obtain that and, and use these opportunities not to sort of wallow in any kind of, you know, disarray or, or, or um, lack of um, lack of transparency, but use, use this as an opportunity to really move, move forward. And, and it's evident that in a time of uncertainty, um, you need that illumination the most, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think the one thing I'd add to that is like, as, as like a segue into our next question is like the, the flip side of that, or honestly, the, the twin of that is you, the whole impulse, the whole imperative is, is make the most out of every ounce of work you're doing, right? If you're doing work and you're facing cost and margin pressures, any thing in a process that makes you leak that revenue needs to be sussed out and closed because you that the whole point is you need that that revenue that money to come in um maybe more than ever as the as the global economic downturn bites and i think the same is true as we transition into, into our next question of making the most out of every ounce of your existing customer base in your existing employee base right it becomes that much more important to really rely on what you have if you expect maybe new things not to come in so obviously in a tough economic climate there is an increased pressure on organizations to optimize existing customer and employee bases with a major focus on retention and on lifetime value. So Tech Market View also predicts that this imperative is going to drive demand for increased levels of certainty that observability data can provide. And that essentially means having observable data about the experience to analyze that gives you the ability to A, pinpoint causes of problems that could impact retention and experience outcomes that otherwise might go unnoticed, and B, to increase the productivity and efficiency of teams by eliminating the observed complex complexity that is getting in their way. So Brent, in your role in advisory, I know you're spending a lot of time helping businesses out there in the market with this. When you're thinking about how to optimize experience and lifetime value for both customers and for your workforce, the talent, that, the lifeblood of a services organization, what are some of the levers you think business leaders should be reaching for in order to change things? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great question. We, we uh, you know, of course, are a, a vertical SaaS platform focused on the services business, the, the services industry. And with that, there's sort of a bifurcation. We've, we have professional services that are more embedded with, with software companies. And then I think more your, your pure um, service providers, advisory, um, consulting, BPO, and so forth. So the answer might differ a little bit. Uh, for either context, but but the theme is the same. One of the things that's interesting when we talk to clients in both both of those sets of um, um, customers and potential partners that they often come not so much in their journey of maturation to really understand what's out there in terms of automation and, and process. It's really around illumination and measurement of how is the business doing and um, we have been counseling and really digging in with certain clients on going beyond kind of those base metrics that we understand are important. Um, billable utilization is, is, is critical for both a management consultancy or an embedded service organization. But really, what are the things that are the friction points in the business that would prevent you from coupling closer with clients? with deploying the right level of talent at the right time that's still affordable and brings you margin or or being able to react or transform or engage a client a new opportunity um, pitch and win a new logo you know and it usually comes down to things around supply of talent match to demand so we look at things like how long does it take for you for instance to cast a team and what would a metric to improve look like? And let's come up with a time to staff metric that's right for your business, whether you're internal service uh, or you're external. And this notion that you really only improve uh, what you do measure and what you set out and say, now, of course, with an automation platform, there's an array of data points available and, and you can suddenly be awash in data points. But let's come up with five or six. Maybe it's uh, time to staff, maybe it's gross margin on predicted engagements, whether that's with an existing client or whether that's a net new logo. Um, 
looking at matching pipeline and supply in, uh, to demand, saying, you know, are our systems connected so that we can see um, from existing clients as well as new what the demands on our talent are going to be? And um, to your point, I think we have a question uh, from one of our, our guests of how would a platform like ours um, be able to illuminate that transparency? It's um, our, um, Bono made a, made a point and a call out to our, our SPI research, and they have a great term around firms that are going through their maturation journey called um, heroic maturity. So a firm that can really only see 30 days to 60 days out is probably executing fine. They're getting work out the door for their clients. They organically understand who they've got in terms of talent, but they don't have um, processes, technology in place to really help enable beyond that. So an easy answer, a simplified answer would be simply, if you're using a CRM or a platform that's connecting conversations that are nurturing and you've got a decent amount of rigor, it doesn't have to be forensic level of rigor around your new business process, whether you're a consultancy or a software company, making a connection from demand of, here's what our current clients want, here's where um, net new logos might come in, translating that to talent, uh -huh. who um, is available, are they the right fit? And then if we have gaps, who are we going to need? I mean, that's just this like a simple distillation of hooking up platforms, but also overlaying that with process around um, some new business rigor and then automation. Um, we're working with a client right now who's they're heavy in the um, mobile application development and connected things, Internet of Things type devices. And they have a really for a services company, an extremely rigorous new business process. Uh, very built out Salesforce environment and um, really, really good rigor at sales sales process. What they lacked in the back end was connecting that data to really be able to cast their team. So, um, you know, we're, we're helping bring those together. But I think um, those notions really break down those levers that are right for your business. You can never get too close to existing clients, but really relentlessly measure, challenge those expectations and um, measure, 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 whether it's in interaction with existing clients and there's some kind of automation that, you know, is tied to CSAT all the way through um, net new logo ac acquisition and ensuring that you're measuring probability all the way through. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add again, Jamie, thank you for your question. Um, I just wanted to add to what Brent said and just being a little bit more specific on how Cantata uh, thinks about uh, and, and solves for, for this is that, uh, you know, again, starting from a pipeline stage, uh, it's, it's, you have generic, we have resources that are role-based generic resources that, that get assigned to these uh, pipelines items that are far enough so that you have, you know when they're getting closed, you, you know the types of roles that are needed, and therefore it allows you to forecast based on that close date. But also you have your backlog. So there's full visibility, again, coming back to the point of transparency, it enables full transparency, not only of, of what may be coming, but also the backlog that's there. Uh, based on the skill sets that you're avail that you have available, and those that you own, where you use generic resources, it, that allows you to forecast as long in to that backlog and and as needed. The other part that I wanted to bring up is not just the resource forecast. Again, going back to some of the other points we made around transparency, being able to know where your margins are at. It also because everything is focused on your resources, your skill set, and, and, and allocation of those resources appropriately. Um, you can also forecast for things like margin, uh, your utilization. So not only are you looking at utilization after it has happened, you're actually forecasting what your utilization looks like based on the resource allocations you've done. It, you're forecasting what your estimated complete is when you've done that. So these are some of the transparency that with the right process will, will um, sort of make sure that you've streamlined your business. 
with that, Charles, back to you. Yeah, I think Jamie's question, and thank you for asking that, uh, and great answers, Brent and Banu, kind of positions us nicely to, to transition into our final question, which gets at that notion that, like, look, this sort of optimization, this sort of process rejiggering is just not possible in spreadsheets. <laughs> You're not going to be able to run your business in spreadsheets or 17 different point solutions or solutions that have really become so outmoded that they're truly legacy. And what I think most businesses that hadn't already gotten up that curve had to get up that curve during the pandemic, right? Every business sort of had to take a step back and go, whoa, if we can't, if we don't have the technology to help us understand what's coming and act on it, we're, we're really screwed. And so one of the things that we're seeing from some of the research that's coming in is that despite the negative signals about the economy, we're seeing data from, uh, from a firm like Infotech that shows that most IT professionals actually expect that their budgets are going to increase in 2023. Um, in fact, 55% of the respondents in that study anticipate a bigger budget next year than they had last year, even though the economy is certainly maybe in a much more unstable place. 28% expect an increase between 6 to 15%, another 8% expect an increase between 16 to 30%. So Banu, what is your take on that data that shows that the majority of businesses are actually being proactive about an economic downturn by aligning their IT spending with business priorities when I think most people would instinctually say, all right, we have to cut budgets. And it doesn't seem like that's what a lot of businesses are doing. Yeah, thanks, uh, Charles. And going back to um, sort of a brought up uh, by Michael Sprenza, our CEO, um, and I think the saying goes, you can't save your way to growth. Um, that's absolutely that's absolutely truth, right? And the it's, it's, it's interesting, right? We're in probably the second downturn in, in the 2000s, uh, 2008 being the first recession. And I think there was there was a belief that technology, you know, investments, but things that had been planned were some of the first things to get uh, put a hold on. Uh, it wasn't seen as critical back in 2008. But we've progressed to a point where digital transfer transformation is, right? I mean, everyone is needs information needs it's fast it's it's and it's impossible to get to where you need to be to optimize your business without the technology so this time around it's it's very different and that i think that that's weighing into some of the statistics we're seeing in terms of uh you, businesses and it understands that technology is critical to get to that some of the streamlining some of the rationalization that's necessary right and i just want to call out that technology clearly is not the only thing that's needed right i mean we we all hear people process technology but also governance is critical right in these tight um sort of uh, business uh, uh, situations, I think it's critical to make sure that in your process, you've end using technology to enable um, some of the governance steps, such as, uh, you know, making sure that uh, you have, you, you're doing reviews in timely manner and, and have the process to be able to escalate and react and respond and get, re get uh, input. That's just as critical. The other thing I wanted to point out is that it's very important to keep it simple. Um, we engage with our a lot of prospects, and they have a lot that they need to solve, a lot of problems, a lot of opportunity. We show them the capabilities that Kentata has to offer, and they get very excited. And um, the, the interest is to get it all in place all at once. And Generally, our, our approach and what we recommend for any kind of uh, automation is make sure you take small steps, um, understand, adapt your processes, make sure you have the adoption for some of the base capabilities because that's already going to move you ahead in your in your maturity. And mature capability as you mature the process is, is critical to, to keep it simple. Don't over-engineer get the adoption, continue to grow with the capability that, that you have. The other um, 
I see Jamie, you're, uh, I'm very excited to have you as an audience, I have to say. So thank you for your questions. Um, so you, you asked with respect to the previous question, whether um, you, you were asking about Kintata capabilities and whether uh, the, uh, the capabilities that Kintata offers would help support strategic HR functions. It would in the sense that uh, being able to forecast your uh, resource capacity needs uh, based on your demand, which is you know the, the more comprehensive demand that starts from pipeline, allows you to early on identify any gaps you have in skill sets and therefore, you know, just to get more technical in terms of as we actually int integrate with ATS systems, et cetera, to be able to then translate that into demand on a timely manner. So it's more proactive management of uh, capacity gaps and being able to put those out there into the market and, and recruit them um, versus, uh, you know, reactive. Uh, we need someone tomorrow, HR, go, go get get us um, the individuals. So uh, Brent, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, I think, you know, the 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 survey um, that Charles noted from Infotech, uh, we, we've seen data from from there and other analysts saying that that IT spending um, will while it may not boom, um, will continue to grow. Digital transformation, which is a, a very broad term, but it's everything from upgrade of existing systems to really improving a customer experience in a, in a B2C um, company, all the way through um, digitizing individual employee experiences. And look at the massive investments in remote work and tablets and infrastructure there. That can't suddenly be turned off. And broadly, you know, if you look at like, Gartner or HBJ, anyone who measures these indices, the trend was accelerated really by necessity in the pandemic years. And the investment in digitization broadly is not going to change. How that translates to a platform like us and why we still see um, pretty significant growth, though more deliberate from our services clients, is, is simply... Um, to the point of really around talent, um, IT services continues to really grow because the talent in the labor market in that segment's really tight. So conversely, those consultancies still see um, pretty good growth and they need to digitize. So to a platform or automation around um, resource, resource management, project collaboration, tying, um, the sales journey into into the platform um, such as ours um, continues. So all those, I think, are are borne out. I think they can be corroborated with lots of studies, but it's really a trend that's been going on, you know, a couple of decades and now really accelerating. Right. And I think on um, the past 36 months just saw, you know, a lot of firms are just caught unprepared and really accelerated. And they're like, you know, listen, if we're, we're going to have a few bumps in the road and some uncertain years, we're not going to turn off that spigot completely. Absolutely. Um, so before we sign off, uh, which, you know, we're, we're, we're heading towards, I wanted to check in with you guys. Any final advice that either of you would give uh, that we think is critical to address during these types of economic downturns? You know, I read, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, as far as advice, I mean, really, the leadership style and adaptation is really, really unique to each business. I'd say broadly that there are elements of social contagion that are driven by doom and gloom news cycles. And um, this has been um, really studied and, and you can go to um, uh, HBR, um, um, Stanford has a professor named um, in the graduate school, Jeffrey Frenner, who has studied this and saying like this notion of highly publicized layoffs um, starts this cycle of, 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 of chatter and even contagion. Like, well, if XYZ brand did it, then we have to do it too. And the data shows that even, um, you know, we're looking at the FANG companies, you know, Facebook, Amazon, um, Microsoft, Google, um, highly publicized rifts certainly they were really kind of returning just to some equilibrium around 
pandemic level employment. So there's always uncertainty in the in in the, the global markets. There's always um, some, and it's not to diminish the level. Um, certainly, a global pandemic, terrible land war in Europe, um, but there's always some turbulence. And to grow, I think, you know, in my times leading different services organizations, it was always to grow boldly and with purpose, but with a healthy dose of paranoia as well. <laughs> Say, you know, you can't just rush headlong into the fray, validate, make sound investment decisions, um, you know, build adjacent practices, is don't don't invest net new in one, you know, with a with a on a wing and a prayer and a promise and a handshake from a client, you know have that as service companies we're always sort of those you know sharks that have to keep on swimming in the for, for the revenue train but but with with sober equal kind of calm diligence that you know this too shall pass and there's plenty of data that supports that i mean goldman came out two weeks ago and lowered their recession forecast and from you know a fairly rosy 35 percent down to a downright bullish 25 percent. so um the highs aren't going to be that high. The lows are usually not that low and, and somewhere it uh, would resolve itself in the middle. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's a lot of material that's coming up that's saying that's predicting maybe there will be soft landing. Right. Um, so uh, to add to what you said, Brent, I would say, um, again, going to what Dan Shapiro's interview communication, like make sure that as you go through the process and um, synthesize it, that you're communicating to your, um, you know, to your base, your, to your talent, so that they, they understand the process that's going on there, not because they are also hearing this impacted uh, by it. So make sure that they understand leadership is looking at this, processing it, taking all the information inputs to make the right decisions and and the basis for those decisions. I think that's critical to keep the uh, colleagues engaged and, and um, I guess, the anxiety away so that what's important, which is our clients, right? Um, and then uh, the other thing is do an assessment of how much, how, um, how healthy the transparency to your business is. Like, make sure that you know whether you have the right information, what is the right information that you need access to, and whether you have that at your disposal to be able to make that information. Uh, if you don't, close that gap very quickly, because if you don't have the transparency, there's not much else that matters, really, because you don't know that you're taking the right actions. So that's the the last um, sort of point that I wanted to leave with the audience. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for letting me bounce these questions off to you guys. This this was great. And as a, it, it's been great, and we appreciate the, you know, the audience uh, participation and some engagement. We've got another session two in the series coming up. It'll take place on March 9th at nine Pacific, noon Eastern. In that session, we'll be talking to our chief people officer, Gina Hartigan, around prioritizing the employee experience in a more volatile um, time of, of uh, uh, a more la volatile labor market. So I, I think it'll be a great conversation. I'd encourage if you found some nuggets of, of insight in this session, some links to some cool research, expect more of the same as we, uh, we go on this journey. So March 9th, at uh, nine Pacific, noon Eastern. And I have to add, I will, I'm more practiced now. It's going to be my second LinkedIn live session. <laughs> <laughs> we expect better performance. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.